been an uptick in interest lately in sedevacantism because of Bergoglio in the past nine months or so. Uh, he has done so many outrageous things and said so many outrageous things that people are thinking a little bit more than they used to under Ratzinger and, and John Paul II. So I will present uh, all of the forms of reaction to Vatican II and comment on them. I will explain the fundamental principles which guide our decision concerning how we react to Vatican II. And I will show Sedevacantism as the only viable Catholic solution. And I will answer objections to Sedevacantism. I will speak about opinionism, and I will speak about the unicum mass. So first, what are the principles? <clears throat> The fundamental question concerning all of our reaction to Vatican II is this. Is the religion of Vatican II Roman Catholicism or not? When I say the religion, I mean the ensemble of doctrines, disciplines, and liturgical practices. Those are the three essential aspects of religion, any religion. Are those three things taken together, the entire ensemble, do they, taken together, represent and consist of Roman Catholicism? Is it Catholic or not? And there is a yes or no answer to that question. The, the answer that we give to that question will determine everything else that we think or do about the problem of Vatican II. And it's very important to situate yourself in that regard, concerning that question. Usually, the way that we go is by a reaction to the new Mass. The, the traditional movement was born out of a reaction to the new Mass. But the mass and liturgical practices of the church are the, what we might say, the face of the church. But they do not constitute the foundation of the church. Doctrine does. And if we remain simply on the level of reacting to a mass that we don't like, that we find something wrong with, but never getting down to the fundamentals, we are going to make errors. Because that is simply, essentially, a gut reaction. I don't like this. This doesn't speak to me as Catholicism or as a Catholic Mass. I don't like it. I want the traditional Latin Mass. That's usually the root of, of someone who is reacting to Vatican II. It's not wrong, but it is insufficient. Now, no one challenges that there have been changes in the Church as a result of Vatican II. Every single person in the world would agree with that statement. Now, let us look at the changes of Vatican II. Principally, they are ecumenism, that is, at the, the, the real bottom of Vatican II. Uh, Vatican II was called to consecrate ecumenism. And from ecumenism came various other errors, such as religious liberty, such as a new conception of the Catholic Church, uh, and uh, collegiality in order to conform the Catholic Church to the Greek Orthodox way of doing things. It all comes back to ecumenism, and even ecumenism has a more fundamental principle to it, and that is relativism of truth. Modernism destroys the Catholic notion of absolute truth. The absolute truth of the Catholic Church prevents the Catholic Church from being ecumenical. But once you destroy the absoluteness of Catholic dogma, then the door is open to ecumenism, which was condemned in 1928 by Pope Pius XI. And so there have been many, many liturgical changes, many, many disciplinary changes. I'm sure all of you are familiar with those. I don't have to go over those. There is a whole new face of Catholicism today in comparison to what it was in 1958 when Pius XII died. You would not recognize the church uh, of 1958 
uh, and of today as being the same religion or the same church. So the question is, are these changes of Vatican II substantial or accidental? That is, have these changes gotten into the substance of the Catholic Church, the very essence of the Catholic Church, her doctrines, her liturgy, her disciplines? Or are they merely accidental, something like changing the color of the walls in your room? And there is, no, there is nothing in between substantial and accidental. Any change that occurs in nature is either substantial or accidental. If I burn something up, that's a substantial change. If I paint it a different color, that's an accidental change. There is nothing in between. So these changes of Vatican II are either substantial or they are accidental. Another principle we must, must understand is that the church can never change substantially. She is indefectible. It is impossible that there be a substantial change of the Catholic Church. If it happens, it means you have a defected church. However, another principle is that the church is subject to accidental change. The church does not say Mass, if we look at the traditional Mass, in, in exactly the same way today as it did at the time of the first century AD. It was somewhat different. Even at the time of St. Gregory, it was slightly different. The offertory was brought in during the, the, the early Middle Ages from the Gallican Rite, for example. St. Pius V added certain things to the Mass. He brought the prayers of the foot of the altar into the Mass from the sacristy. He added the last gospel. So there are, the Catholic Church has always been subject to substantial change. Look at the Eastern, excuse me, accidental change. You look at the Eastern rites. They are accidentally different from the Roman rite, yet they are substantially the same worship. So the, that question of substantial or accidental change is capital, because if Vatican II merely represents accidental change, then we must accept it. And the traditional movement has no reason or purpose for existence. If it is merely accidental, we may not like it. But if, if it is merely accidental change, we cannot oppose it on any solid ground. It might be better or worse, you could say. It, it might be less expressive than the traditional right or the traditional way of presenting doctrines. It might be more expressive, but if it is accidental, it doesn't affect the substance of the Catholic Church. Another question to ask concerning the Novus Ordo is, can I save my soul by practicing the Novus Ordo religion? If I go to the church that, uh, that Bergoglio wants me to go to, my local parish church, and I practice there the Mass and the sacraments and everything that he prescribes for me? Is that the path to salvation? Is that pleasing to God? Can I save my soul in that, in that environment? Is the Novus Ordo, and by that I mean the whole ensemble of doctrine and practices and liturgical uh, practices, uh, it, it, is that pleasing to God? Is the Novus Ordo pleasing to God? Or not? There's a yes or no answer to that. Those questions must be answered before you can go anywhere with regard to deciding what to do about it. Soon, John Paul II is going to be canonized. This means that a man who made it his life's work to promulgate Vatican II and who, who participated in liturgical abominations against the First Commandment in the name of Vatican II, namely Assisi, that he is going to be canonized.
That means that not only can you save your soul in the Novus Ordo, but you can become a saint by promulgating the Novus Ordo. That's going to be a big problem for the Society of St. Pius X. If he's a saint, and he promulgated the Novus Ordo and participated in all of these ecumenical acts, then how, how do they stand? If you can go to heaven and be a saint by doing that, then what is the purpose of the SSPX? So the answer to the question will determine the Catholic response to Vatican II. Is Vatican II Catholicism or not? The answer to that question will determine our response. There is a yes or no answer as to whether Vatican II is Catholic or not. There is no gray. There is nothing in between those two things. If the answer is yes, it is Catholicism, then we must accept Vatican II. If it is no, then we must utterly reject it. There is no gray between those two things. There is no middle ground. Either it is accidental change or it is substantial change. There is no middle ground between those two things. It is like a fork in the road. If we say yes, it is Catholicism, then the proper attitude toward Vatican II is to accept it. Submit to the authority of the Church. If the new Mass offends our sensibilities, then we can seek the motu proprio mass. We can say to the proper authorities that we would prefer the traditional mass and they might give us the traditional mass in place. That's what they have done by the motu proprio. That would be still a Catholic response that we're saying Vatican II is all correct. The new mass is correct. Everything is, is in order. It's just that our sensibilities prefer this. That is essentially the position of all of the religious congregations that adhere to the motu proprio or who have some sort of indult or permission to use the traditional mass, like Christ the King, and this is a fraternity of St. Peter, others too. If the answer is no, it is not Catholicism, Vatican II is not Catholicism, then we must reject Vatican II and all of its reforms in the same manner as the Church rejected heresies in the past. Then we are in the same position as Catholics in the 16th century. We must reject it so fundamentally and so firmly that we have to be willing to die rather than to participate in any way in this substantial distortion of Roman Catholicism. There is no middle ground between those two positions, because it either is Catholicism or it isn't. Another important principle to understand is that it is impossible that the authority of the Catholic Church promulgate to the whole Church false doctrines, evil discipline, and false liturgical practices. This is the guarantee of Christ to the Catholic Church. Whatever thou shalt bind upon earth shall be bound also in heaven. If this were not true, then the Church could and would defect in her essential mission, which is the salvation of souls. If the Church universally could give to the whole world something that is displeasing to God, false worship, false doctrines, evil disciplines, then it becomes nothing better than the Church of England or any other religious body that has no guarantee or assistance from God. 